Welcome in, everybody. It is Seth from Bully the Board. Today, we are going to ask the question, can you use publicly available models to beat markets? Specifically, we're going to talk about using KenPalm um, and see if we can actually use this model to beat the college basketball spread market specifically. Um, we're going to start with how we think about that problem, what data you would need, um, and some of the ways we're going to test it. And this will be a, a couple part series that will break down um, the results and what we see over um, the season. We've already, uh, we'll talk about it in this video. We have a thousand game sample that we can look at for some results, which will inform a lot of the decisions going forward, but we'll break it all down. If this sounds interesting to you, Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and without further ado, let's hop into it. Give a damn about a hater when I feel like it. Not today, not today, not today, not tomorrow. Get out my way, please. I'm trying to get paid. Not today, not today. All right. So, like I said, we are starting with the question slash hypothesis, whatever you want to call it. You know, can we use models like Ken Palm? to uh beat markets um and so i, I really want to start with um uh, let, let's start at the beginning right let's let's start at maybe you're unfamiliar with Ken, what ken palm is and uh you know how can we we think about this problem so ken palm is uh, a man his name is ken pomeroy and he has been forecasting and looking at college basketball data I think for like 20 something years. So he was definitely one of the first uh, in, in, you know, the forecasting business to actually look at data, try to use that to forecast games. Obviously where we are 20 years later from Kempom starting is, you know, a vast different space of not only information, but data itself. Right. So Kempom is by far not the only version of this. There's, an, there's some other Bart Torvik is another one you can look at. But Ken Palm is really looked at as, I think, a hallmark of college basketball data. And the interesting thing about what he does is he uses all of the data to create what he calls a fan match, um, but is a prediction, right? It's a forecast. Uh, it's a forecast for what he thinks the score will be and who will win, right? So from this, he's saying that Creighton at Butler, he thinks that Creighton will win uh, by one point and he'll, they'll win 53% of the time. Specifically, he's saying, 76 to 75 right and you know this is a saturday slate we're looking at it's february 17th today so a big big um, slate here for college basketball so the question that we asked ourselves was can you actually use these types of models to beat a market and win money um something like college basketball is an insanely efficient market and you can see here um, even as we scroll through i mean the the screen's lighting up with all the different moves on a busy busy saturday morning where uh, you know markets are you know moving based off of sharp action at market makers and uh you know there's hundreds of games well maybe not hundreds but there's probably there's over a hundred games today let's see if it actually tells us how many um yeah it's over a hundred there's over a hundred games today so i mean it's a busy busy day it's obviously a busy busy market the major power five schools are going to have a lot more liquidity. I think some of the you know smaller schools obviously have lower handles, less liquidity, but nonetheless can still um, you know be looked at as as efficient markets in most cases. So the question becomes: Can you use this information at all to beat beat the college basketball market? So you know we've learned a lot in building all of our college basketball models, and so we've used a lot of those learnings to inform the question. And so in my mind, you know. I have a lot of certainty that you can't beat uh, the closing line, right? With Ken Palm, why? It's just so ubiquitous as far as the information is concerned that it's going to be baked into a lot of the opening lines, in my opinion, and therefore using it for the most part is going to result in you kind of quote unquote fading a lot of the market, which is again not a good idea, assuming efficient market hypothesis, which for college basketball I think is something you can assume for most of these games. Um, the other thing we're going to test and assume is, you know, regressing to the market. What does that mean? It means that, okay, Ken Palm thinks this is, you know, one point spread, but what does the market think that this spread should be? You know, I think a lot of the things that, you know, we did for a long time without thinking about what the market is doing and not utilizing information um, from what the market is providing, right? It's something we see a lot 
to in, in, in talking to people. It's this idea that it's you versus the market versus really trying to find the best forecast and then really quantifying those edges. Um, and we've, we've seen a lot of success in our models by using the market as a, you know, basically a reference point, comparing and adding what the market has to what your number has can give you much, uh, a much more robust forecast. So that's, that's kind of the hypothesis we started with. So what we did is we actually went and we scraped, um, a thousand Ken Palm games. Basically, this goes back to, I think, around the beginning of the year, maybe in uh, December of 2023. Um, and what this allowed us to do is to ask some questions and see if there is an edge to be had and what that looks like. So I'm going to run some code here and, and we're going to we're going to walk through um, what what this is. So, you know, I talked about regressing to the market. So we have an opening line and a closing line you know, you can, you can see these numbers. We were, we're regressing to the market 75%. What does that mean? It means that the opening spread is 75% of the forecast and the chem palm number is 25% of the forecast, right? And you can do that for the opening spread and you can do that for the closing spread. I think this is a really key uh, part of any forecast. This allows you to not over quantify the difference between the value you see or perceive and your actual value. The reality is you never have the edge that you perceive there's always an imperfect amount of um, knowledge that you do not have. Um, and so you want to make sure that the market is being well assessed. Now, you can you can test, you know, different thresholds. Um, the 75 percent is not something we um, always use. This is a kind of an optimized number for results. Um, for instance, our NFL models use 65 percent and our college football models use 75 percent. And so, you know, we played around with these numbers to see. Um, the other second part is a value framework, right? So you can see here on the Kempom side of things, Creighton minus one is basically what he's making the spread, but he gives you the probability of winning. Well, in this case, you know, the, the, the minus one and the 53 are probably pretty close because in order to win, you have to win by at least one. But let's look at spreads where they're larger than that, right? So Wisconsin is a two point favorite. So what does that mean? It, you know, he has a 56% chance of winning, but what's the probability of you covering a two point spread? So you have to you know, generate those numbers. So luckily we did, we've done this a lot in um, um, college football and NFL. So we have experience. So what we did is we used the last four seasons of data and we created a value framework. So a value framework is basically a, uh, basically a, a sheet that looks at but looks at all the different combinations of spreads and margin of victory and then quantifies the probability of those things happening based off their frequency. So we can, uh, I think I actually can show you what that would kind of look like. Um, yeah, actually, it's right here. So you could see you have a market line and you have the true line, right? So this is what you make the number. This is what the market is. And then you have all these different combinations, right? So, it, you know, you the market is minus 60 and maybe you make it, you know, minus 50, whatever. You have all these different combinations. So you have all these different combinations and then their corresponding probabilities of covering, right? And that's what these are. So let's go down to so like, you know, we were talking about the minus ones. So if you're if, if the market says you're going to win by one, and your fate and your model says they're going to win by four. Well, you're going to cover 63, you know, percent of the time. Well, that makes sense. You have a three point edge. That's obviously a very big edge that that doesn't happen very often. But let's look at the situation where the market's minus one, but you um, are one, uh, you make the number two. Well, you see, you have a slight, you know, slight edge. You have a 54 uh, percent edge, right? So when you're betting into a 52.38, you know, aka minus 110 odds then you have about a one, you know, 1.6% 1 edge, right? Which is great. That, that, that's what you're kind of looking for. So that's what a value framework is. And that's how you would generate it and how you would use it. Now you can make value frameworks even more uh, robust. You can look at the push and loss probabilities, which will get you a little bit more of an accurate um, expected value. But for the purposes of this, we're really just looking at probability of covering. Um, so when you use something like that, then you now have, you know, a piece of information. We were just talking about it. If you, you know, and, and we have this on the website for free. If you think that, you know, the market is a minus one, 
but you you think the the true spread is minus two um and um you know if we can do minus two then you know there you go but you just saw what what did this do it automatically regressed it for us what does that mean remember we talked about the the true edge you have so your chem palm number was two but the market was one so you know it weighting that one 70 75 percent so when you weight it you end up getting a forecast of just one so point being a one percent a one point edge maybe you know not enough for you to actually bet it right you, you may you may be taking way too many bets that you perceive an edge in but it's actually not a true edge okay so anyways, that's that's what this code basically is going to do. It's going to take the opening spread. It's going to weight at 75%. It's going to take the chem palm forecast. It's going to weight at 25%. It's going to come up with a new um, number that we're going to call the forecasted number. And then it's going to go look at that number and compare it to what the opening spread was. It's going to look for games that have at least 1.65% um, value. You can make this number whatever you want, but I've already done all the work to optimize these output and let's see what we see. All right. So in this sample, there were um, a total of 59 um, games that were perceived uh, or a expected value of one, uh, 1.65% 1 or greater. Um, and of these 36 of them covered and 23 of them lost or didn't cover. Um, again, you can do this analysis if you want um, for just doing, you know, any expected value. So, you know, expected value of zero. We can we can run these numbers and you can see what we'll see. And what you're going to see is a bunch. So and go, you go from what was it, 59 to 209. So four times as many bets um it's still profitable but your volume is through the roof so this is you know quite a gauntlet of bets you'd have to make now the one thing i want to point out is you need to be looking at this from two different perspectives the home perspective and the away perspective right because the the home team versus the away team effects could be different and so what when we test this hypothesis we actually do measure that these are quite different not only is the volume quite a lot less for finding volume on betting on the away team um, we see that the win rate is actually a losing win rate. And then when, when we you know combine both of these together to see what we would get if we just blindly took any value greater than zero, home or away, we see we only end up with a 51.75. We would have bet on a total of 371 games, which is uh, quite a lot of games um, out of this 1,000-game uh, sample. But we would have lost, right? We would not have uh, covered the VIG. So that's why you want to test you know what is optimal for making profit where do you see the edge where do you not see the edge so this is where the 1.65 comes from i think you could get away with even going as low as one but if you look at home team performance um and this is both favorites and non-favorites basically any home team if we focus on these guys and anything greater than 1.65 percent value we have a pretty good um roi and win rate right our 61 percent is really good now we have much lower win rates again, uh, again on the road for looking at the road wins, but in that sample we still are profitable at fifty three percent. So this is what's informing kind of the hypothesis going forward. The hypothesis for me from this data are that there's probably much more value on betting and focusing on home teams, and specifically home teams that are at least one point six five percent, you know, edge to win uh, to cover that game. If we look at that sample, it's obviously a lot smaller of a sample, but it's much higher than ROI. So for me, that's my hypothesis, and that's what I'm going to be testing. So, you know, the cool thing about this is Kempom's data, although it's not, um, you know, you have to do a little bit of data cleaning, it's not so hard to get it into a format that allows you to actually calculate these things for each game for each week. So I've done that already. Um, we have a spreadsheet that we pulled everything in. We use, um, if you're interested, there's a tool called Sports Odds. Just Google it. It's a free API key. You can pay for it if you need more um, information. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to pull in um, any spread 
for all of the games uh, for pretty much any sport. So you can go to college basketball here. You can click points, uh, point spread, and you can fetch. And what it'll do is it'll bring um, all of the spreads, at all of the retail books, um, and then their corresponding odds, right? So you can you can basically run this code, and then you can use VLOOKUPS to go and tell it, um, go look up the, the actual spread given the market, right? So all of this information comes from Ken Palm. Um, we have added this to the website. So if you're wanting to, to use it and or follow along, just go to um, just go to bully the board, go to NCA uh, data and then go to Kempom value. Um, it'll bring this sheet up and you can see the exact thing we are seeing. Um, there is a version for it for dogs um, if you want to use it again. We just discussed um, I think there's going to be special cases in which you're going to want to um, actually use this. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a lot of value on betting away teams. If you want to test your own hypothesis, go for it. So again, we're going to look um, on the slate for today, Saturday, February 17th, 2024. And we're going to, again, we're going to focus on the teams that are greater than 1.65 that are home teams. So why didn't we bet on Wisconsin? Why didn't we bet on Syracuse? Well, because Wisconsin is playing at Iowa. So although Wisconsin's favored, they're actually not the home team. Iowa's the home team. So even though there's edge there, we don't want to bet it again because why we have measured that there's maybe not the same effect for road teams. Syracuse falls into the same category. So that leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games. OK, this is then where we use the combination and other learnings for from what we've learned in you know football. Let's go to the market and let's see what is available and what's actually going on. You know, um, I think I actually want to back up the one minute. One thing that I maybe have glossed over here is when we're testing these results, we're testing them on the opening spread. So what does that mean? It means that we see these results when we bet the opening spread, not the closing spread. Now I can pull this up for you and show you what you get if you bet the closing spread. And it's very, very, very different results. No surprise there. Again, why we talked about the fact that the market dynamic um, is being left out when you're betting basically against the market at a close. So your win rate goes from 61%. You only bet 28 games and you only win 46% of the time. Not a good idea to fade the public now, or sorry, not to pay the public to fade the market. Um, you can see that the away record goes up a bit, uh, but again, still not profitable. If you were to combine these, you are very much a loser and making, uh, you know, losing money over time, not winning money. So really, really key, important factor there, right? Bet early, bet openers when the, the information in the market um, is not as strong, right? I mean, there's, there's not a lot of the market making books have taken a lot of big action on you know games that have moved it one way or the other and you go from a game not having value to having value only because the move happened right the a game goes from not showing value but some syndicate comes and bets it it moves to a number where your model or chem pumps numbers perceive that there's value but really what that's saying is you're fading the market right you're fading the market dynamic and you know chem pumps numbers are just not accurate enough to do that so what do we want to do with the um, the numbers that we're seeing? I guess and let's let's look at this. So Gonzaga was one of the bigger ones. I know that um, our model and our value framework perceives a lot of value on these big favorites. Um, if we go to the value framework, what we're going to see is you're going to see that at high, high numbers, the favorite teams just cover so, so often a high percentage of the time. So if you can bet a minus 30, this is basically going to tell you not to bet it all the way. Even if it was minus 29, you forecast it was minus 29, the spread was minus 30. It's still giving you a 4% edge to beat it. Now, the problem with why it's doing this is sample size, right? There's not a whole lot of games in a five-year sample that have 30-point spreads compared to, you know, a, a, a one-point spread, for instance, right? So the sample size here is vastly, vastly different. And that sample size, you know, low sample size leads to to variance. But that being said, I've double checked all the diagnostics here as far as going back and back testing. When it comes to these big favorites, um, it, it 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 is it's a it's noisy. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it, but it doesn't look like it's so noisy that you should just ignore it. It looks like you got to kind of just lump it in. So I know that this says it's got a uh, 14, 14.48 <laughs> percent edge. That's probably that's not real. 
That's just not real. You do not have a 14% edge. You shouldn't be betting more just because you see this number. That's why you want to test these kind of minimum thresholds so you know how to te treat it the same. Now, I have done the work um, to find kind of this pattern of like, as you go up in value, where does it start to plateau, right? Where do you actually see, you know, you go from 1.65 to 2 to 3 to 4, you know, where do you start to see that plateau? And it starts to happen right around that 3%, right? That's where I think you're probably just capping your value at around that number. You probably very rarely see any true edge that's greater than 3% in the market. Um, that being said, part of this hypothesis, part of this testing, you know, therefore won't be using like Kelly criterion to say, okay, well, I have a 1.6, you know, percent edge for this bet. Um, I have a 14 percent ad, you know, how much should I bet? What's the optimal amount? I'm just going to bet the same amount of my bankroll for all of these. Right. Which is going to be one percent. OK, so let's let's talk a little bit about these. So Duquesne, I think, is an interesting one to look at. So if we go to Duquesne, it, I ran these numbers um, last night right when they opened, And what I saw was, although they opened um, around. Where is it? Basically, I, it opened around one. Um, based off the numbers that we pulled in and maybe it was just a mistake. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do cane here. I wonder if, if this has just ended up being a mistake and way, way we can do this is we can go to the value framework or we can go to the, um, yeah, see for whatever reason, FanDuel has it at minus 120. So it's pulling in the wrong number. Um, but they, but they have it at minus 120 odds is the problem. Um, and so the rest of the market was at one and a half, two and a half. And so, yeah, that's actually a good, that's a good, good call out. See, so basically long story short, why haven't I bet it? Well, I bet I didn't bet it because I need a one and a half and one and a half are not in the market. The only one and a half is at Duquesne minus minus one twenty. which if I go to my, my calculator here, if I, if I was able to get the minus one, uh, 1.5 and we make the number minus two, the regress number, right? This will cover 54% of the time. The problem is instead of betting into a 52.38% market, I'm betting into a 54% market, right? And you'll see here, what do you know? My break even is 54%. I go from having a 1.65% edge to a negative 0.71. So that's why I didn't actually bet this. Miami of Ohio is another good one. If we look at the market here, so we can go to Miami of Ohio. We can go to the market making books here using our unabated odds screen. Circa is a pretty good one. We can look this open at minus three minus and move to minus two. Um, bookmaker opened at pick them and moved to three and then two and a half really quickly. Pinnacle. What did Pinnacle do? Pinnacle has basically been at two and a half the whole time. So this number was at one and a half. Again, probably an error based off of where we're seeing um, this be pulled in. Let's double check. And what do we see? Oh, yeah. Again, FanDuel doing these weird shit where they, they're pricing it very interestingly, basically at minus 120. So again, this actually wasn't EV. So even though it shows EV, right, you want to double check all this. So Because again, we're betting into a 50 for this one. We're betting into a 50. 54% break even. And what do you know? So that is those become negative, which is good to see, right? We're, we're kind of getting rid of um, getting rid of bets that aren't actually value. Um, let's do this one. Boom. Another one gone. Okay. You see Santa Barbara. So this is where I'm a little bit hesitant to be completely honest with you. And I think they play Hawaii, Hawaii. Yeah, so this is still sitting at one and a half. The problem with these schools and these handles is they're going to be extremely small. The liquidity of a market like this is very, very small. So, um, you know, Kem Palm's making it a minus regress number of two. We can get one and a half in the market. The question becomes, do we actually trust the liquidity enough to bet this? So there are one and a halfs we can get. Uh, BetMGM, uh, PointsBet has this. Um, ESPN. Um, it looks like DraftKings and FanDuel have shaded this a little bit um, to Santa Barbara. And I think that that's, I, I don't, it's hard to know. Are they doing that because of Ken Palm? Um, I'm not sure. So 
I opted to not bet this one. Um, and then Bryant, another basically same situation of very low liquidity team, very low liquidity market. So I opted to just bet these three, right? So Gonzaga, again, shows a big edge, but it's because of this 31 point lead. Dayton um, is another one that we uh, liked that we had to be a little bit patient with because this technically opened at 14 and a half, but was at was at 15 at some of the market making books and wasn't actually available. 14 and a half was not available um, until uh, this morning. So I was able to get the 14 and a half over at, um, I think it was DraftKings, um, the 14 and a half. And then the other one is Oakland. Um, this is another one um, was able to have, be a little bit patient and get the minus one, uh, the minus, I think, 21. Is that what we're looking for? Yeah, so we want we make the number 21. The market is 20. Let's see here. Oakland. There it is. Yeah. And we bet this over at um, DraftKings as well. Um, and the market is kind of moved against this, right? 21, 19 to 20 and a half to 19 and a half. So some money's kind of coming in support of um, IUPUI there. Um, but 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 all good. So basically, this is this is the hypothesis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start betting these teams, home teams at open that I can find at least 1.65% value or greater on. And I'm going to bet one unit on these. And I'm looking for a large sample size, right? We don't want to make any conclusions um, over a, a small sample size. So even if I go three, uh, oh, and three today, this is this is be a bad idea to just say, oh, it doesn't work. We have a thousand game sample size using and testing that this shows value in that sample size for over for, you know, 59 percent or sorry, 59 out of those thousand games. So we want to make sure we're getting a sample that is, you know, roughly that in order to measure something like this. So if you're interested in you know building out these things using available models, these are the types of things you need to think about. Right. So you have some data, you have some model that shows you what the spread or maybe the total is. So you need a way to quantify that edge. What is, what is the probability of covering either the spread or the total, right? Once you have that, you're going to want to regress that to the market. You're going to want to test that. It's probably going to be anywhere from 55% to, you know, 85%, right? Um, the best models in the world, Massey Peabody, regress to the market 55%, just to put it in perspective. That's how much you always respect the market. And, um, you know, college football models, I know some really good models, they regress to the market 85%. Um, so it's, it's somewhere in there, right? And then you're going to want to use those two pieces of information to come up with a cover probability or a total probability or whatever it is. And then you're going to want to bet the ones that have expected value. Um, and you, you saw, you saw the relationship here. You know, you, I personally like to bet, um, I like to bet stronger effect sizes. So, right. I'm, I'm betting only 1.65% bet games, but I'm leaving. Look at how many games I'm leaving off. Technically speaking, I could bet all of these games, right? And when you do that, you increase your sample size. And when you increase your sample size, you decrease your variance. The problem is, can I effectively get down on, I'm just going to eyeball this. This looks like 25 to 30 games every, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, it, it becomes quite a big deal. And also my swings each Saturday, you know, Thursday, Saturday, Tuesday are going to be quite large because I'm going to be betting 30 games, right? So I'd rather wait or I'd rather bet things with larger effect sizes where my sample size doesn't need to be as big. If you want to realize a 0.7% edge, <laughs> for example, you need an insanely large sample size to realize an effect size that that is small versus if you have a 1.65% edge, you don't need as big of a sample size in order to measure or or see that effect, right? It's it's a larger effect. So you don't need as many um, observations in order to do it. So you're going to see that theme a lot in, in what I'm doing here with the hypothesis, but also what we do in NFL. You see in NFL, we only bet things with 4% or greater. Why is that? Well, it's because sample size, right? I, if, if you don't have, or if you want to be betting a lot more, on each bet versus a lot less and you want a volume, well, then you're going to want to be looking for games with larger um, edges, which is going to lower your overall sample size, but you're only betting games with larger 
um, edges. So right, it's a it's a trade off. Now, if you have a huge bankroll, you know, if you're if you have a hundred thousand dollar bankroll and you're you know wanting to bet a hundred dollars a game like something like this, then you have a bankroll that probably can survive thirty bets, uh, you know, every day. Right? You can you can see the swings. You can get down. And, and the volume is your friend if you truly have an, an expected edge on every single bet you make. And this is what a top down method is, right? This is fundamentally what people are seeing. There's people and professionals sitting here today, right now, watching the screen, watching for moves at the market making books, and then making the same move at the corresponding retail books before they move the line. They're doing this for all the games, <laughs> for all of the major markets. So a day today, like today is an insanely busy day because they could they could bet 50 games, right? There could be 50 games where the market moves in a certain way where they can they can find value. So um, that that is what this is going to be, right? We're going to try to see, can we actually in real time, um, you know, use Ken Palm's numbers to beat a market based off of the learnings that we've kind of learned over the years with uh, developing our college mo- or um, our, yeah, our college football model and our NFL model and see if something like Kempom can actually give you a fighting chance to make money. I'm, I'm really curious to see if it's the case. Obviously, we showed in this uh, smaller sample that, you know, maybe it can, maybe it can, but you really want to test these things and see if one, you're even actual a- able to catch a lot of these opening lines. So just because we, we just saw it in real time, you know, FanDuel had that minus one up, but it was juiced in, in in a way where it actually wasn't value. And so although there was a one and a half in the market, the price made it not bettable. And really the true open was two and a half. Right. And so you want to, you know, can you actually get these money down? Can you actually bet these games? Do they only exist for, you know, five seconds? You know, I've seen some NFL or I've seen some college openers, not ex- not exaggerating, guys. They literally last for 20, 30 seconds. You know, a number literally only lasts for 20, 30 seconds in a marketplace before it gets bought up and moved. And um, and that's what is happening at market making books, right? Bookmaker, uh, Pinnacle, Circa, that is what they're doing. Take a bet, move the line. Take a bet, move the line. And that's what they're doing, right? These, these are truly markets. You can see them lighten up in real time, right? These are because people are betting them in certain ways, right? And then these moves will get propagated through the market at the retail books, right? And that's and that's the name of the game. So this will be a, a multi-part series. Um, let us know in the comments if there are any other things that you want us to see test out. But this is a kind of good intro for maybe if you want to start thinking about these things. How do you want to um, maybe create your own, mo- you know, maybe not create your own models, but you can use publicly available models to bet in interesting ways. So if you want to follow along or you want to use these tools yourself, like I said, everything is on our website completely free. If you go to the NCAA, you can see the value tab here. It'll pull the games up. You can identify them yourself. So if you want to um, you know, try this out yourself or try a different hypothesis, go for it. The calculator here has that value framework. So you can um, you can access this um, and, and, and get the expected value for any bet using any model. It doesn't have to be Ken Palms. It could be your own. Um, and then if you're interested, technically speaking, I think you can get it through it, get it through here. Let's see. Um, value framework. Yeah. So if you just, if you need, if you wanted the value framework, you could literally just copy and paste this, um, uh, this, uh, CSV, I think it's just loading. Yeah. There you go. If you were to just copy and paste this, you'd have your own, you'd have the value framework, um, table look up. So if you wanted to create your create your own process or whatever. You can build these out pretty easily in Excel or, or Google Sheets. Um, but everything is everything is available for you to, to try to use to beat the market. Would really love to learn from you guys in the, in the comments. How are you guys thinking about these things? Um, some of the things we're measuring, right? And part of this big hypothesis is home teams have, there's a huge effect there. There's a huge effect. And there's really, it seems like it's so pronounced that you almost shouldn't even be betting on road teams. Um, maybe that's something I'm over, you know, analyzing, but I mean, I can't really see the numbers work and I've, I've looked, I've spent, you know, hours looking at these, this thousand game sample that we have, and it just doesn't look like there's a lot of value in betting those maybe in, you know, very specific cases. Um, so it really does look like home field and home court advantage is very, very important. And then it also looks like there is, um, some, some, you know, 
well, it's really just home teams, right? Whether they're favored or not. And then that stratification on how much value you really want to bet. Again, I showed you the numbers. If you wanted to blindly take anything with value, you will make money more than likely, specifically if you focus on only those home teams. But you're just going to have to bet what I guess about 56 games. So I was wrong. <laughs> uh, oh, no. So 56 minus 18, which what was that? 56 minus 18. That was around 30, 38. So 38 games you would have to get down on. And I mean, it's probably a little less because they're not all these teams are going to be home teams, right? Some of them are going to be away teams, which you basically wouldn't bet. Yeah. So more head state you wouldn't bet. Um, but long story short, right? It, it, it's a big sample size. So it would be a, a bigger, um, undertaking and that's something i'm not trying to to do as we build out college and nfl um more and, and work hard there so this is just an experiment to see how things go but yeah let us know in the comments i'd love to, to learn from you guys what are you thinking about how are you thinking about it any other ways you think we should think about this data that you would like to see um in the future and if you guys need any help with anything or have any questions just put them in the comments dm us however Bully the board on all socials. Go to the website. You can email us. We're very responsive. Um, but uh, yeah, guys, without anything else, um, I think we can uh, can just kind of stop it there. And um, and yeah, so like, subscribe. Let us know if you have comments. And uh, take care, guys. Be well.